Today is our honor to be speaking with Professor Michael Cameron. Professor Cameron is Associate Professor of Historical Theology at the University of Portland in Oregon and the author of the text that we'll be discussing today, Christ Meets Me Everywhere, Augustine's Early Figurative Exegesis, available from Oxford University Press. Professor Cameron, thank you for being with us today. My delight, thank you. Professor Cameron, you've been working on Augustine for a very long time. Tell us about your initial interest and some of the significant steps along the way in your research of St. Augustine. Well, it depends on what you mean by initial, because um, when I was growing up, I uh, was fairly unconscious, religiously speaking. Um, I was 20 years old, kind of aimless, dropped out of college, um, went looking for, you know, a path to move forward and um, found myself in a situation actually out here in the Pacific Northwest, where uh, a friend of mine had... Uh, his old college books with him, and um, I just picked uh, a book off the shelf and said, can I read this? And it was Augustine's Confessions. Um, uh, a, a teacher had once said, if you ever get the chance, a Latin teacher had said, if you ever get the chance, you should try reading Augustine's Confessions. So, and I, uh, it, it was nothing short of life transforming for me. Um, I, when he narrated his conversion and, you know, walking through the doors of faith, uh, he he walked me through them with him. And uh, so it was really my first exposure was uh, really to awakening to a real life of faith for myself. Um, but fast forward 20 years, <laughs> I, I actually had gone into graduate studies in New Testament at the University of Chicago and, uh, you know, was really into biblical study. Um, but, you know, found myself asking theological questions alongside all the, you know, intense historical critical things and um, just decided that I uh, wanted to move more toward theology. And so I ended up moving toward modern theology for a while and then realized I missed ancient texts. So I and I thought, well, what about Augustine? And I was very fortunate that my soon-to-be advisor, Bernard McGinn at the University of Chicago, had just finished the first volume of his Foundations of Mysticism uh, series, which he is still working on. I think he's on volume seven now. But he had just finished the first volume with a masterful exposition of the mysticism in St. Augustine. He was very interested, and we, we collaborated. He's the one who suggested studying the expositions of the Psalms and so on. So that was a kind of, you know, second uh, initial uh, uh, exposure, if you will, on the kind of scholarly level. Thank you. Professor Cameron, in the first chapter of your book, which is titled Eureka in Milan, when Ambrose taught Augustine what he already knew, you described the transformation of Augustine's understanding of the scriptures that came about through Ambrose's preaching. What happens at this juncture in Augustine's life? Is it simply that Augustine comes to understand and accept allegorical interpretation? What's taking place? Well, not unlike my experience, and this is one of the reasons that we came together, I guess, when I was a young guy, he was on a perpetual spiritual search. Uh, he was at, really at the top of his professional game as a rhetorician. Uh, in fact, uh, not only had taught rhetoric, uh, but had just received a major promotion into the imperial service as the emperor's panegyrist moved from Rome to Milan just for that reason. But all along the way, he'd also had a spiritual search going on, which had led him, for better or worse, to, into the arms of the Manichees. And so this, this was an, a, a powerful moment for him um, because he was actually disenchanted with the Manichees by this time. He's in his early 30s. He, he felt like it was a, a, a fruitless uh, 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 participation that he'd had with the Manichees at this juncture. He, they weren't uh, uh, thinking, you know, holistically about, about the intellect. Uh, he... he thought the myths were, were, uh, weren't credible. At any rate, when he heard Ambrose, he was sort of blindsided by this old wisdom in a new form. That is to say that uh, he could portray these ancient scriptures, which he had dismissed uh, as a young man, a Ciceronian a rhetorician, he dismissed for their bad style. 
And um, as uh, as a manichae, he had uh, basically slandered as being unspiritual. Suddenly, Ambrose was able to portray these scriptures as both beautiful and deeply spiritual. He did it by connecting with Augustine's rhetoric. In my uh, in my view, um, Augustine taught daily this uh, this uh, skill uh, for would-be lawyers and politicians, right? Ambrose was able to portray these ancient scriptures as a very long and skillful, skillfully constructed and beautiful speech on the part of God's uh, spirit. That led him into the deeper inner recesses of the spiritual teaching of these ancient texts. And to see essentially here, it's the unity of the Bible as one long uh, uh, composition, so to say, on the part of God's spirit. So he was able to enter into these deep scriptures uh, in a way that he had not before. So it wasn't just a matter of accepting a method. It was a deeply spiritual uh, new venture into uh, wisdom that uh, Ambrose was able to give him. That's why it's a Eureka. Yeah, I found it, you know. Thank you for that, Professor Cameron. Professor Cameron, if you can help me with this, I've long been puzzled. In, in uh, the next section of your book, you discuss Augustine's first commentary on Genesis, his first commentary project on Genesis. And mm -hmm. I've noted that uh, Augustine, through his life, mounts no fewer than five distinct commentary projects on Genesis. Genesis, a refutation of the Manichees, is the first project in 388. Four others follow, if one includes books 11 to 13 of the Confessions and also book 11 of the City of God. Augustine right. never makes it past Genesis 3. In all of these projects, he's only looking at the, the first several chapters of Genesis. What is, it, what is Augustine attempting to do in his first commentary project on Genesis? Well, there's, uh, uh, there's several projects going on at once. Um, first of all, we can note that he, there are five different commentaries, as you mentioned, plus, you know, obviously all the uh, different other kind of sidebar discussions that he has in letters and treatises of different parts of Genesis. He, and there he does go into the Abraham story, the Jacob story, Sarah and uh, Hagar and so on. But... Um, he well first of all he is motivated by argument by polemic i mean this gets his rhetorical juices flowing the most once he comes into the orthodox faith he becomes uh, a, essentially a nicene christian um he understands he, the the veils are uh, are pulled off of the manichaean project and his first attempt at Genesis is meant to counter the Manichees. That's why it's it's a polemical work, really. It's an ex, it's, it is exegetical. It does draw on his wisdom received from Ambrose about uh, uh, the letter kills and the spirit gives life. It does draw on that, but he's got an agenda. He's got an ax to grind. So, um, and the, pr the, the first chapters of Genesis are going to give him essentially the, the tools for constructing all the big larger arguments that essentially is going to be his, uh, uh, you know, uh, attack against the Manichees, which is to say, I think at the core of it all is how the eternal God, the spiritual God, relates to earthly, temporal fleshly, creaturely existence, how, how the two go together. How does the eternal come together with time? How does the spirit come together with flesh? How do you get from in the beginning God to created heaven and the earth? You know, that, well, that's what, you know, transfixed him, obviously, in Confessions 11. He never even, never you know, never mind the first three chapters, he doesn't get past the first verse. Because it's that crossover, I think, that really grabs him. Now, that's at the heart of, I think, what the Manichees were trying to get at, because they made a strict 
and uh, we would say dualistic separation between eternity and time, spirit and flesh. Um, there's an essential relationship that he has given himself to, and I think it's what, uh, more than anything, defines him as non-Manichaean. Uh, despite, you know, some recent scholarship that wants to, you know, portray Augustine even well into his time as bishop as being a crypto Um, And there were charges of that even in his own lifetime for other reasons. I think for polemical reasons, Julian of Aclanum and later in his life says Augustine is still a Manichaean. Uh, you know, I, it, to me, those are, they don't hold a lot of water for me, um, uh, they're interesting metaphors, but uh, I, I don't think it's really true. The Manichaeans themselves certainly didn't believe that. All the, the polemics against him, which are reproduced in some of Augustine's works, uh, not only against Faustus, his former uh, accomplice, and even his tutor um, in North Africa, but uh, there's some others, Secundinus and uh, Felix. Uh, they all said... <laughs> Come back, come back, you've forsaken us. All right, so the Manichaeans themselves don't think much of that thesis. But anyway, uh, back to your point. The, uh, I think the essential issue is the relationship between time and eternity, uh, between flesh and spirit. Genesis gets at that, particularly the first few verses get at that in a way that uh, other uh, texts don't do quite so sharply. And, and then there is, of course, a focus, not to say an obsession, on the uh, Adam and Eve account, which uh, you know really sets up the entire uh, temporal salvation history scheme that he wants to address. So there's an awful lot, as you know, packed into those first three chapters of Genesis. Um, now, he first goes at it from the spiritual angle. Uh, which is to say, on Genesis against the Manichees from the late 380s, is it, it's really drawing on Ambrose's and ultimately Origen's approach to Scripture using 2 Corinthians 3, 6, the letter kills and the spirit gives life. That's a hermeneutical um, interpretation of that text, which actually Augustine uses a little differently later on. But his first text is really from a spiritual angle, spiritual interpretive angle. However, the major uh, argument against the Manichees really, and, and the Manichees themselves worked on this level, they worked on the sense of the literal sense of the text of Genesis. And for them, that disqualified this text from being uh, Christian uh, because of its you know, deep embeddedness in carnal, dank flesh. For them, which was, they were hyper Gnostics. They were, you know, for them, this was evil. Um, so his second real attempt in the early 390s is to interpret Genesis on a literal level. And there he only, he gets the first 25 verses. He, he, he stops at Genesis 126. He notices this 30 years later and picks up and adds a few verses and then, you know, sort of puts it back on the shelf. So he... <laughs> He tinkers with stuff, too, you know. He deals with the spiritual angle on things in confessions. And then early in the 400s, he goes back to that literal sense. And so on Genesis, literally interpreted, De Genesi ad Literam, is his next project, which he completes in 12 books covering those three chapters. And it's, uh, you know, it's really a mature work. And, um, you know, there are lots of little fruitful side trips into uh, different aspects of, of Augustine's theology. So um, for him, it was an incredibly fruitful three chapters in, in, in the Bible that set up a lot of other things for him. Thank you so much for that reflection. Professor Cameron, in chapter five of your book, you chronicle Augustine's discovery of the Apostle Paul and his subsequent commentaries on Romans and Galatians. How does this yeah. encounter with the Apostle Paul shape Augustine's theology? Yeah, that's a rich subject, and um, it's it's one that uh, it would be so wonderful if we could get a team of people uh, working on this. Actually, there are people who are working on this sort of thing. Uh, 
Um, he reads Paul as a Manichee. Paul was incredibly important to the Manichees. And uh, in fact, the, you know, the kind of tendencies Paul has to oppose law and gospel, for instance, really kind of played into the Manichaean dualism. And the contradictions, so to say, quote unquote, I'm saying, between Old Testament and New Testament, he found very convincing as a Manichee. He mentions this in Confession 7. Well, um, so he becomes uh, a Nicene Christian under Ambrose, and he reads Paul really as a spiritual reader, which is to say his first quotes uh, uh, have to do with, uh, they're sort of origin-esque, if you understand what I mean. They are deeply interested in the spiritual wisdom, say, out of 1 Corinthians 2. We speak wisdom among the perfect. That's the sort of level he's reading Paul in his first phase as a, as a Nicene Christian. As you know, he's surprised by ordination in the year 391. He becomes part of the church there as a presbyter, we might say priest, um, underneath Valerius the bishop. Uh, there's evidence to my mind, and I put it in the book, that uh, that Valerius may have been a strong prompt in pushing him toward reading Paul on a pastoral level, not just the spiritual and ascetic level. Um, I mean, there were his Manichaean contacts as well. He had arguments with Fortunatus in 392. There were, there were things going on there with his arguments that dealt with Paul. However, after the uh, he gets to be into that ministry position. He sits down with the scriptures in a new way to really try to take account, uh, try to take the measure of the importance of Paul and, and others. He, he does a, a piece on the Sermon on the Mount. He starts working on the Psalms, but he's also got a focus on Paul. He writes a couple of texts on Romans, uh, one of which is, a, again, a commentary, unfinished, but he has a series of propositions on Romans that are that's very important. And he writes a, a letter to uh, a commentary on the letter to Galatians, a complete commentary, his only complete biblical commentary, in which, and this gets at the heart of your question, I think he encounters Paul as a thinker of salvation history. In other words, there's a kind of uh, the highfalutin word is diachronic, but the, the a, a temporal perspective in Paul in Galatians that I think hits Augustine very hard, in which he is able to understand. I think he believed it, but now he's able to understand better how flesh and spirit come together in the temporal process, particularly in the person of Jesus Christ. The incarnation, and in at this time, I think the crucifixion of Jesus becomes extremely important for him being able to see how that temporal process works out in terms of the anticipation of the Old Testament, in terms of the proclamation of the New Testament being married together. All right, so he comes up with a, a, a scheme, for instance, of the four ages in which he sees not just temporal process and history, but salvation history. There's a time before the law, there's a time under the law, there's a time under grace, and there's a time in peace. All right, that's, that's a vision of history uh, from a spiritual perspective. I think Paul gave him the perspective to produce that schema. I think it affected him very deeply forever after, because it allowed him to see how the flesh of Jesus Christ was crucial to salvation. It wasn't just a, 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 an accommodation to humanity of a spiritual reality, although it was that too. It, wasn't, it certainly wasn't just the dress of a divine being, you know, that's what the Manichees thought. It was, it was kind of an illusion. No, it was crucial to the conveyance of grace and spirit, the flesh of Jesus, the humanity of Jesus, by which I don't mean the abstract essence of his humanity in some essentialist way. I'm talking about embeddedness in culture, in language, um, in, in particularly his Jewishness. 
Jesus Jewishness. He's not, he didn't just become a generic human being. He became a Jewish human being, which brings with it all the apparatus of the Old Testament, the prophecies, the kingship, the Psalms, the patriarchs, all of that becomes a kind of, as he put it, a kind of womb for bringing the humanity of Jesus forward. He keys on a text in Paul, 1 Timothy 2, 5, where Paul speaks about the one mediator between God and humanity, the man, double underline, the man, Christ Jesus. That becomes an important text for Augustine from about 394, about the time that he's writing the commentary in Galatians. And it becomes absolutely central and staple to him throughout the rest of his life and in all of his works. So I think he solved an issue for himself in that period. It connects also to a text, John 14, 6, which you I'm sure know well, I am the way and the truth and the life. He had, he had quoted that text many times in the 10 years previous to the commentary in Galatians. Uh, but only the first part, I am the way, and rather, uh, the last part, rather, I am the truth and I am the life. These were divine attributes. Uh, he had never quoted the first part, which is interesting. Uh, we notice in the, in the uh, uh, um, text uh, against Fortunatus that Fortunatus quotes it. Now, the Manichae quotes it. So we realize it's an important text for Manichaeans. I am the way. Augustine doesn't ever say that until this moment when he figures out, to my mind, what the humanity of Jesus means as the way for us to his divinity. And he begins to say things like, he not only became the destination, he became the way to the destination, Jesus. He uh, was, as he says in De Doctrina Christiana on Christian teaching, which he wrote about 395, 6, uh, in that area. He says, Jesus became not only the, he's not only the physician, but he's the medicine. He's the medicus and he's the medicina. He's got the, uh, uh, the Latin play on words in there, the medicus and the medicina. He is the doctor and he's the medicine. He's, so he's the divinity and he's the humanity, Right. He gives us our health, but he's also giving, he gives us the way to the health. So I, I think he solved that, uh, and Paul helped him with that. Professor Cameron, thank you for those deeply insightful comments. In chapter six of your book, Christ Meets Me Everywhere, Augustine's Early Figurative Exegesis, you present uh, uh, Augustine's interpretation of the Psalms in light of Christ. How do the Psalms present the key for Augustine's exegesis? Well, it's a nice follow-up question to the previous one because I think the, the insight of Paul that he uh, took from Galatians and Romans um, fed right into his developing expositions of the Psalms at the same time. In particular, he was able to read the gospel story where Jesus himself quotes the psalm from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, this is Psalm 22 for us, Psalm 21 for him in the, in the Septuagint Vulgate numbering. He sort of, the way I think of it is he sort of triangulates this with uh, the psalm itself and with Paul's statements about Jesus' crucifixion in which we are included. And you know the text from Romans 6, we were crucified with him. He reads that as a hermeneutical uh, uh, revelation, so to say, although, you know, I mean, it's not, it's, it's certainly mystical. It's certainly, uh, you know, it speaks about our salvation as well. But he, he, he reads that as a hermeneutical uh, clue to, Jesus' quote of that psalm. Now, what he thinks is going on there is crucial. He realizes that when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's not speaking for himself because the text of the psalm says it speaks about my sins. Now, 
he he asks, say in the exposition of Psalm 37, Augustine will ask, well, how can how can Jesus speak about my sins? He 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 was not sinful. We know this. Okay, well, I'll tell you what's going on. He was not speaking for himself. He was speaking for all of us. He was speaking for us sinful people. That is to say, in shorthand terms, he was speaking for Adam, the sinful one in whom we are born, and saying, why have you forsaken me? The me is not me, Jesus of Nazareth, but rather Jesus of Nazareth identifying with and taking up the identity of Adam, the sinful man in whom we are. So what that does is not only give us a, a, a picture about salvation, the exchange of redemption that happens on the cross, it certainly does that. It's also a clue a revelation, again, hermeneutically, that Jesus, as divine word, is the one who is actually speaking that psalm through the psalmist in the ancient text, you see. So there's a, another argument for the unity of the Bible uh, over against the Manichees. The word is speaking this in the text in the psalm, you see. He takes that as a clue to other psalms. So he begins running through other psalms, and there's a whole string of these, as I write in the book, there's a whole string of these in that early sequence of the expositions of the psalms, in which he pictures the psalm being spoken by Jesus Christ upon the cross. Remarkable. So there, if I... Uh, counted right anyway, I got it in the book, there's seven of these, not just Psalm 21 slash 22, but the, uh, a sequence of others. Um, Psalm 15, which would be our 16, uh, he, he speaks in that way, and there's several others. Now, he, he also unveils in that same sequence a concept that becomes absolutely crucial for all of the expositions of the Psalms that he will perform and, and preach in the next 30 years to come, and that is the bondedness between the head and the members. His shorthand term for it is totus Christus in Latin, uh, the whole Christ. That speaks Christologically, and it speaks ecclesiologically because Christ and church are one being. He He speaks of them as one person. Now, they have a kind of duality, but it's not schizophrenic. It's one person, and he's using the word person not in a psychological modern sense, but rather in, a, uh, in the Latin persona sense, which is more like related to a theatrical mask in which he can speak on behalf of another, you know. And that's his point, that in the Psalms and elsewhere, Christ takes up the voice of the church and speaks for the church, where also the church at times takes up the voice of the head, voice of Christ, and speaks for Christ. And so there's an intimate interchange and an interrelationship. Augustine saw this at work in the Garden of Gethsemane passages of the Gospels, where Jesus cries out, praying to the Father, let this cup pass from me. Well, he says, he's not speaking for himself. This is the Son of God. You know, Paul wasn't afraid of dying. Why would Jesus be afraid of dying? That's his sort of reasoning. And he's saying, look, Jesus is speaking for us. Jesus is speaking for our sake. And in a sense, when he says, not my will, but yours be done, there's a great passage in the expositions of the Psalms where Paul, uh, Augustine says, well, what Jesus is doing is taking our bent will, bent in ourselves, really, you know, familiar idea from Luther, and bending it back into straightness so that it matches up with the will of God. So he says, see yourself in Christ. Jesus is crying out to us, see yourself in me. So when we're incorporated into Christ, through the church, through baptism, we are 
being incorporated into this moment of Jesus' own life in which he's doing for us this kind of, you know, bending of the human will back into God's uh, uh, straight edge, so to say. So the Psalms become crucial hermeneutically for the whole Bible, particularly because of the Christological, ecclesiological concept of the totus Christus. Professor Cameron, thank you for those masterful comments uh, and, and exposition of, of Augustine's method of exegesis. Hugely appreciate that. If I can ask two questions uh, as we bring the interview to the close. Um, first of all, some say that the Reformation in the 16th century is in some way an extended argument of uh, over Augustine, his theology and the reception of Augustine. What's your view? Well, there is an aspect of the Reformation that is that, particularly the late Augustine, the anti-Pelagian Augustine. Um, I mean, that's really where the, the swords cross uh, over grace and free will. Um, you know, the fight between Erasmus and Luther very early on in the Reformation points to this. Um, Erasmus really wasn't defending Augustine so much as he was trying to defend Origen, I think, uh, whom he said, interestingly, he said he found 10 pages, uh, a, a page in Origen was worth 10 pages of Augustine. It was pretty provocative stuff from Erasmus. I'm sure we'd have really gotten under Luther's skin. But, I mean, you can see the 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 index of the Institutes of Calvin, for instance, is just page after page after page of references to Augustine. A lot of that has to do with grace and free will and the Pelagian controversy texts of Augustine. Um, you know, it, from another angle, um, the church ideas, the ecclesiology of Augustine, uh, really falls more toward the Catholic side. I, I don't think the reformers were terribly uh, taken with Augustine's ecclesial concepts. Uh, it was more about the individual and grace and free will. So anyway, I, I think a full appreciation of Augustine would put things more toward the center. There's a little bit on each side that goes each way. I think Luther and Calvin had something to say to the Catholic Church, which we are, when I say we, I'm speaking as a Catholic, uh, you know, we're still, we're getting that, you know, we have to honor grace. And actually, there have been people all through Catholic history who've appreciated that insight about the, the, the sovereignty and the, uh, and the operative quality of grace. But uh, anyway, we're, we're coming back more toward uh, uh, a center, I think, um, more spontaneously rather than in the, you know, kind of in the, the, the arguments of PhDs, you know, there's a, a, a more of a spontaneous coming together, which I think is going to find some deep riches to draw on from the undivided church, which remember Augustine was part of the undivided church. Um, that'll bring his ecclesiology back into focus as well as his grace and free will. And if I can ask a final question that I've been asking all of the interviewees on this program, yeah. and that is, uh, what would it mean for the church to be united today? Yeah. How would we even recognize this unity? And what can yeah. we do to pursue the unity of the church? Thank you. I, I think Augustine has a lot to, to contribute to this. Uh, despite some people's thought about him and some of his reputation, which find, you know, they find him kind of divisive, I, I, I think there are deep resources for our coming unity, our future unity, uh, particularly in this ecclesiology I've been talking about, the, the reciprocity of the church, the exchange of heart within the church, the, um, the, the unity that is in Christ, not in our doctrines, not in our authority structures, but in the spirit of Christ, in, in really, uh, I, I think of it as, as a, a mystical unity, which exists. It's not something we're going to achieve, it's something we're going to find. And Augustine is going to help us find it. Uh, I think the totus Christus uh, idea is extremely fruitful and provocative, um, uh, with possibilities. And I, I, 
there's a passage out of a, out of a wonderful book that I uh, have appreciated for many years, uh, H. Richard Niebuhr's uh, The Meaning of Revelation, in which he speaks, he's not speaking of Augustine at all, but I think it speaks to this thing I'm thinking of, that it's when we can own each other's history that we can uh, begin to find and express this deep inner unity. And the passage I'm thinking about in that book is when he speaks about when a Catholic is able to look at Friedrich Schleier Schleiermacher and say, he is one of ours, by extension to say that of Calvin or of Luther or of John Bunyan uh, or of George Fox uh, or John Wesley, and to say, he's one of ours. By the same token, when other communions can look at uh, uh, figures, great figures in Aquinas, you know, uh, or a Pascal um, uh, or a uh, Karl Rahner and say, he's one of ours. You know, if a, if a Presbyterian can say he's one of ours, that's when that unity will begin to appear. It, it may appear in the, in the language we use about each other's theology, which I think is already happening, even this discussion that we, you and I are having right now. I, I don't think this could have happened even 30, 40, 50 years ago, uh, or it wouldn't have happened. Not that it, people wouldn't have desired it, I just don't know if it would have been, uh, there would have been a structure for it, you know, a common language, and that's, you know, I love the idea of, say, the University Press, you know, Ancient Christian Commentary Series. These, th this is an evangelical tradition publisher recovering the church's tradition from the undivided church. That's awesome, amazing, wonderful. And it's this sort of thing in which here's one segment of the church saying they belong to us, you know? Um, I've known many evangelicals. I've been, I've passed through evangelical churches. Uh, I was part of an evangelical church for a while, uh, way, 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 way back a hundred years ago. Uh, they didn't think in terms of the church fathers, trust me. That's happening now. That's pretty amazing. So I think we're on a path and let's keep it going. It's been our honor today to be speaking with Dr. Michael Cameron, Associate Professor of Historical Theology at the University of Portland, and also author of the text that we've been discussing, Christ Meets Me Everywhere, Augustine's Early Figurative Exegesis. Dr. Cameron, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, it's, it's been, been a pleasure, Jonathan. I appreciate the invitation. invitation.